Hey everyone, this is uh, day five, Friday, week six, and this is our final day of our uh, key-themed week. Uh, we've done very, very different paintings. Uh, we've uh, done a high-key painting with a little bit of contrast. Uh, we did a painting chock full of character. We did a painting that had no, or not really no, but very, very small differences in value between all the uh, tones that were in the painting. And I think today we go back to character because if you know me, I'm always about character over likeness. And, um, and we haven't explored uh, uh, contrast by saturation. So we're going to control a ton of the midtones and make, you know, make them the, uh, the most overpowering value in our painting. But we're going to have areas of contrast that, yes, have to do with value. But also, we're going to keep that same midtone value, but actually change the saturation. And that's going to create contrast by saturation within a midtone key painting. So let's see how we do in those mid values and let's see what we can push, you know, by, by um, using saturation as a tool. Okay, so that's it for this week. Thank you for hanging out and I'll see you next week. Whole new theme. Okay, let's get started. And as if you know, we never learn our lesson. I'm back with my <laughs> with my uh, rigor brush, with my lining brush, doing my drawing. But I, I think I had uh, a little more success uh, uh, <laughs> with this one today. And I felt that the shapes that I was getting from the beginning were giving me a, a sense of what I wanted to do. And because it is another portrait of another friend painter of mine, I thought whenever you paint other painters, fellow painters, you really feel like you have the <laughs> the opportunity to just take risks. And if the other painters are like-minded, they will totally understand and support that you do anything. Like if it, when people paint me, I always tell them, "Do whatever you want, you know, absolutely whatever you want with me." It, I I feel it's just such an honor to have other people paint you. You're going to be able to see how other people look at you and how they push certain things about you. I think that that's awesome. That's absolutely awesome. And, and how other painters really understand themselves through looking at you for hours. I think that's that's incredible. That's an incredible exercise. So whenever uh, other painters have done the same with me, um, I, I absolutely love it. The watercolor that uh, Benjamin, Ben Bjorklin did of me, I just adore. I absolutely adore. So in this case, I was very happy that I could paint Gokan because I, I had met him many years ago at the uh, New York Art Academy. And I thought he was a brilliant painter. He was a really, really br brilliant painter. He still is. And when I was looking at uh, some of his uh, current work, I noticed he was doing something that was that would very much fit into this week's theme. And it's something that we haven't quite done really, which is uh, exploring how we can maintain a key. In this case, it's gonna be a lower key for this painting, sort of like a mid-tone lower key, but we can generate contrast, not always through value, through differences in value, which there are gonna be because that lamp, that ellipses behind him, is going to provide the shape that is going to be a lighter, brighter shape. But uh, the coolest thing is, for example, his ears have uh, subsurface scattering, like that light is actually shining through his ears. It's going to make the ears super, super, super saturated. And I'm going to try to maintain the value, you know, the overall value of the uh, blocking of this of this face, which again is like a lower mid-tone key. And I'm going to try to keep that value, but generate contrast through saturation. A lot of people, they, they feel very confused with this stage of my paintings. I don't do this all the time, but I've done it often. And I think it's happened a lot in some of the paintings that we've done for our painted lives, which is people see me draw and they are confounded as to why I would pick a lining brush and go for, you know, details that are uh, accessible, I guess, you know, by using a lining brush to then <laughs> just grab a flat, softer brush, and in this case, a synthetic one, and then just, you know, cover the whole thing up. Just eliminate all the drawing information that I had done previously. 
And uh, I know it can seem like a little bit backwards, but the truth is, because I, I, I learned how to paint directly from life, that was my art education, I never understood drawing as something that uh, should be uh, kept, should be kept as a, as a precious stage in a painting, especially in, a, in an Alla Prima painting. And the reason is that a very fine drawing remains sort of static. And that sense of security, I feel, was very premature when, when you know, you were painting from life. It's, it's very hard to just say, especially if you're painting like a live model, these shapes are going to stay still. You know, sunlight just moves way faster than we can paint it. And people get tired way faster than we can paint them too. So you do have to, in a way, teach yourself how to commit to a drawing. Uh, but to be honest, I always felt that if you put drawing in a separate compartment, your mind just kind of falls asleep. And, and you already think like, okay, I've done the drawing, now I'm going to think about color. And I can't think about painting in that way. I think everything is interlaced. I think every single moment of a painting or stage of a painting is actually profoundly tied to each other. And I think that the very strong bonds that all these different stages represent in the, in the making of a painting are always present. Let's say, you know, you're working somewhat traditionally and you could be in the final stages of a painting just doing finer detail work, whatever that would mean. And you should still be able to say, no, that finger is not in the right position or the, um, I don't know, the eye is just suddenly, you know, while I was rendering it, it became a little bit smaller and I have to redraw. That willingness to draw, to redraw, to rethink should always be there, should always, always be there. And it doesn't mean you have to pull out like a vine charcoal or a chalk or um, a lining brush like I usually do to uh, redraw and rethink. You can do it through brush strokes. That feeling that you are accessing a drawing once again should always, always, always be there. And I've always felt comfortable with that notion that you have to be on your toes constantly. Your brain just can't fall asleep. The minute, the minute that you catch yourself, like, you know, 20 minutes have gone by and you don't know what you've painted, or if you're painting from life and you're painting 20, 25 minutes, 30 minute poses, and the model rests and you look at your painting and you suddenly say, what did I do? Like, I just worked for 30 minutes. I, I just can't see what I did. The painting didn't advance. I just didn't do anything substantial to the painting. What happened? And I feel that if you catch yourself, if you are really paying attention to what you're doing, then you realize that you were in like autopilot. And because maybe you had this premature sense of security, you forgot that you had to be alert while painting. So in essence, what I do when I'm doing this kind of finer, quote unquote, drawing, when I'm starting out a painting, is actually preparing myself to paint. It's not really making marks that I'm going to really, really super respect. Like, obviously, I want to get close to what I'm going to do. But I'm always willing to just paint over them and to reassess my painting. And a lot of it is just this first encounter that I have with form where I'm teaching myself what I'm about to do. So those marks, even though I cover them up, they are providing me service and they are telling me, okay, just remember that the cheekbone has this specific shape, the brow has this specific shape. When you encounter the eyes, be mindful of this. The bottom plane of the nose has this character. The chin is turning, you know, at this point. All those, all those things, I'm making mental notes of them while I'm doing that initial drawing. It's almost like gathering information. And the information is not lost because the drawing is covered. The information and the, the value of that information has to be stored. It has to be in my head. I have to become super, super familiar with it. I don't find the drawing stage or the actual drawing, I don't find them precious. They are opportunities that can teach me how to encounter this moment where I'm about to paint. But 
not precious in the sense that, oh my God, I just did such a beautiful mark that I'd be an idiot if I cover it up. Now, granted, if we are super, super in tune with our painting, we can assess if we can keep some of those marks in the final painting because we find that they communicate with efficiency, a lot of energy or a lot of the character that we were searching for in our painting. That is totally fine. That is totally true. And that's just being alert while you paint. But for me, drawing is this, this very, very abstract notion that cannot be understood only either as a stage of a painting or as something that's purely technical, that it's just these marks that we usually associate with finer lines that come from either what I do with a lining brush or with a charcoal or with a pencil or with a pen. I think the, the broader understanding of, of drawing is just an idea that is there so that you can actually evaluate if you can access your intent clearly. So a mark is actually telling you, okay, did you understand what you wanted to do by taking this decision? And as soon as you put it down, because drawing has that powerful ability, as soon as you put it down, you go like, oh my God, yeah, I, you know, I am getting closer or whoa, no, I'm super, super far. And I was really off from what I wanted to do at the beginning. That is the real, real power of drawing. Uh, it's not to make nice drawings. It's just to tell you if you're in the right track. It's like if if you have an intent and you and you make a decision and that decision is visible, then you can assess if you're getting closer to that intent. It is pure decision making taking shape. So as far as the painting, I really, really did want to push that cad red in the ear. The whole painting is about that cad red and then how it kind of trickles down through the beard. I would say I sometimes uh, refer to paintings like this as excuses to do this tiny, tiny little moment. And I love that I had the opportunity. Uh, and as far as the exercise that we usually do, I had mentioned um, Sangram Majumdar in, a, in an earlier painting. And I think he, he is a genius of a painter. And, and his work has evolved so much. I, and I don't mean evolved as if he started out at a very simple stage and now he's doing something very sophisticated. I myself actually think that, that my sensibility is a lot closer to the work that he was doing maybe eight years ago. But I actually celebrate everything that he's doing. I, I think that every single decision that a painter takes is just fascinating and it's a learning experience for me. So I think he should be doing whatever he's doing, whatever he wants to do. And I'll just very fondly remember what he did uh, a few years back. But I, I think that one of the most amazing things that he does is that he can control value, you know, like nobody. And eventually what he would do, it was just he would just put this very, very bright, saturated color that just would sit perfectly in, in terms of value. And that's what we have to understand today, that saturation is actually a characteristic inherent to color that can be super, super powerful. It doesn't just mean like, oh, I just want to make things brighter, or I just want to make this color nice. Oh, that's such a beautiful color. And people usually say those things about saturation. It's not about that. The power of saturation really is that you can bring all that brightness all that high chroma at a moment where you just want everything to zing, like an exclamation point. And to do that well, oof, you have to control the whole of the painting so that the introduction of that color can be super, super powerful. Now, a painter that I love and is super close to my heart that does that, I think, insanely well, I think better than almost anyone out there, um, is Andrew Hem. Andrew Hem, uh, aside from being just super creative in terms of picture making and the way he distorts is just absolutely magical all those things all those aspects about his painting i feel are you know very very close to to what i love he does this thing with color he has this muted palette but that's you know just covered in hues he will he will just make just in an insane amount of hues in a painting purples greens grays yellows i mean and and they just kind of flow into each other. It's just this beautiful control of value and hue. And then when he wants to punch something up, he just starts to uh, up the saturation, up the chroma and little bits of the painting. And they just become these powerful, powerful shapes. And he can 
totally control the way you travel the painting because his paintings are super complex. They are characters that are in, you know, this weird representation of space, inhabiting that space, but they also feel a little uh, separated from that space because the relationship between environment and figure is kind of weird. It's a little, little off. But anyways, I, I think Andrew does that just insanely well. So please check out his work if you've never seen his work. He's, he's just magical, magical painter. I think we had a successful painting today. It was a very, very simple painting where we are trying to couple a few things that we've done throughout the weeks. For one, we wanted to have accent points uh, during our painting. So there are accents that are based on a value. So there are darker areas within a midtone where our painting is going to almost ground itself. You ground a painting because you actually stop. You need those areas where you can rest and stop. And those areas give you clarity in terms of, of how uh, form is described. So the uh, the hair and shadow is going to provide me with that. The beard and shadow is going to provide me with that. And the shirt actually in shadow and the collar is going to provide me with those little accent points where I can say, okay, you can rest here, here, and here. It's going to be a really nice rhythm. And we have contrast in value also with that kind of ellipsis that's in the back that it signifies like a, a lamp, like a, a light source. But it's not super, super, super light. I was relying more on the brightness of that yellow, my bismuth yellow, mixed with a tiny, tiny bit of cad red to make that a more yellow orange now. So it's closer to what a cat yellow would be. So I needed that, but again, I was achieving the contrast, yes, with value because it's it's um, a few steps lighter than than the overall picture, but I was also relying upon the brightness of the color. So I, I needed the saturation of that yellow to actually give you a bigger sense of contrast. The uh, exclamation point of the painting is the light actually coming through those ears and just giving it that super, super saturated, just pure cad red with a tiny, tiniest bit of yellow just to make it uh, a little more towards the orange. I love, love, love making paintings that are about a tiny little thing and that you have to almost juggle all these shapes that are around this very, very specific moment, but everything is secondary to that moment. So you're trying to solve all these secondary areas, let's call them, they are very important. And because they are important, it doesn't matter that they're secondary because you have to solve them. I always tell people, don't try to finish a painting, just try to solve it, you know, because solving means that you've encountered a problem and you have to find a way out. I always think that it may seem like semantics, it may seem like it's just a word, but I think when you refer to things as things that you have to solve through paint, is actually a lot better than just saying, I have to finish this. Finish just means something very abstract. It's a really gray area. And throughout painting history, there's so many ways to quote unquote finish a painting that honestly, it just doesn't mean anything. You're gonna be confused. But if you solve it, you're gonna be paying attention to the painting, to your painting, to the decisions that you're making that are actually intrinsic to your painting you are going to be following the rules of your painting to try and find a way out. So I think that it was a cool way to approach that problem today. And I always tell you guys, the most exciting thing about doing these exercises is that there is as many ways to solve them as there are painters in this planet. So <laughs> these were just five very, very simple ways to approach a problem. And I would love to just spark this drive in anyone out there to just say, wow, those were the ways you solved it, but I actually think I have way more exciting ways to do it. And if you can do that, oh my God, more power to you. Like, go ahead, kick some ass and do some awesome paintings. Uh, that's the point of this channel. So I hope you guys enjoyed this week. I hope you guys enjoyed this painting today. I certainly did. And I'll see you guys next week with a whole new theme, remember. So... Thank you for watching. I'll see you next week. Bye.